Some animals get all the glory, even in paleontology. But if you ask me, some of the most interesting animals are the most obscure. And my recent video on Atoya told me that some people feel the same way. So, today we'll be talking about one of those obscure ones, and also one of my favorites. Adestus is very near and dear to me because it, specifically its teeth and tooth structure, inspired one of the characters from my book. As you can see from the art on screen, this hybrid dinosaur named version 2, because that's what he is in the novel, a literal updated version of the first, has the teeth and tooth structure of the Adestus. They grow in a single row in the midline of the upper and lower jaw, something we'll be talking about on Adestus itself in just a little bit. You can consider this video a sequel to my similar one about Helicoprion, a relative of Adestus with a buzzsaw-shaped jaw. Adestus does not have such a unique shaped jaw, but it still had a very unique one. As I said, its teeth grew in a single row running down the center line of the upper and lower jaw, and because of that, the shark-like fish has been unofficially named the Scissor-Toothed Shark. Its proper name means to devour, or devourer, or the one who devours, which, that's comforting. So if you want to know about it, why it's called that, and more, please stick around because we are going to cover all of that and more. Put on your scuba gear and join me for an up-close and personal swim with Adestus, the Devourer. Like and subscribe if you like videos like this and you want to see more like it. It helps me grow and lets me know that you want to see more of them. Okay, let's start with the discovery of the first Adestus fossils. Discovery of Adestus fossils goes back to 1855, with the animal being described in 1856. And in a time when people didn't really know anything about prehistoric animals or what they looked like, something with a smile and a set of teeth like this animal had must have been rather frightening to picture. The holotype specimen was ANSP 9899, and the genus was named by Joseph Leidy. There are four accepted Adestus species with one synonym as well, but 13 species have been named. The type species for the genus was Adestus vorax. The original holotype was also very fragmentary as many fossils tend to be, not helped by the fact that fish like this don't really fossilize their bones at all, it's usually just their teeth. We don't even know where this original fossil came from. Some sources cite Oklahoma, but this is not confirmed. So, that's helpful when trying to study this animal. Thankfully, that was from 150 years ago. We'll have plenty more specimens to study. Actually, no, Spino. Specimens have been found in Russia, the United Kingdom, and throughout the United States, and more. With all these fossils, we can clearly see different species. For example, Adestus newtoni had a much more curved whorl than any other members of the genus. In fact, it almost looks like a helicoprion species, it's so curved. Specimens have been found in Park and Posey counties, Indiana. They have been found in Lay, Iowa. And they have been found in the Moscow Basin and other places. All these species lived in the Carboniferous period of the Paleozoic. Anyway, just a brief history on the discovery and study of the fossils, now let's move on to the actual animal itself and see what this shark-like fish was all about. As I've mentioned, Adestus' scissor-like teeth were positioned in a single row in the midline of the upper and lower jaw, running from the outside of the mouth to the back of the throat in one line. These teeth project outward, and I've seen some pretty horrific reconstructions of it, but no matter the reconstruction, we have to ask, what did it use these teeth for? Well, its name also comes from the fact that it crushed its prey in a scissor-like motion with those teeth in a vertical thrashing manner consisting of up and down movements of its upper body. Then, after the grab and slash dance was done, the prey was swallowed whole, or as in whole of a state that they were still in. There have been many other proposals on what the function of the teeth might have been beyond just what I laid out for you. Like with Helicoprion, some of the early ones were interesting. One early theory proposed that the teeth were actually spines, defensive spikes that ran along the fins or on the back of the animal. Kind of ironic because like I said, Adestus inspired my novel character version too, and he has spikes that run, run down his back, but that is a complete coincidence. I just thought it was kind of funny. The jaws of the animal, though, operated on a two-gear type system. One reason we think they used the teeth for slicing and thrashing soft-bodied prey that could easily be sliced and torn apart 
was this gear system. The gear system in its jaws allowed the teeth to slice over the prey once it was inside of the mouth, and this movement would push prey into the movement of the upper whorl, and then rinse and repeat, top to bottom. We don't know much about the true appearance of the animal itself. Sharks and shark-like fish rarely have their bones fossilized. Occasionally we'll get lucky and skull or parts of the body will still be preserved, but through and through, we don't know what this animal really looked like. Most depictions give it a very shark-like look, though, usually a great white. However, I've seen some, some depictions that draw inspiration from goblin sharks and even thresher sharks. Like something along the lines of Megalodon, most of our Adestus fossils are just teeth, and like with Helicoprion, our fossils consist of the whorls, which were studded with the teeth that were situated inside of the jaws of the animal. These are about the only real clear image of Adestus we have, though very few fossils can tell us a few vital things about the animal, and this one is no exception to this rule. In addition to what I said at the end of the last section, the exact colors of this animal are also unknown. A very common trope is to depict it with the colors you see on a great white. The size of the longest species got up to and bigger than the largest great whites as well. 20 to 22 feet long easily. Larger in most cases, if I'm honest. A lot of prehistoric sharks or shark-like fish are given the great white shark appearance by paleo artists because... As far as sharks go, that is the most recognizable and about as shark-like of a look as you can get. If Adestus actually had colors that resembled a great white are unknown though. Also, let's talk about its teeth again. Look at these. These are serrated blades and where the name scissor tooth shark comes from, though another less common name for it is also the coal shark. These teeth did not fall out when they became worn like you see in sharks today. New teeth would grow at the back of the jaws, and this pushed the older ones, along with the gums, forward, which is why they would protrude from the mouth of the animal. This look also contributed to the name Scissor Tooth Shark, because the result was a very solid set of jaws that resembled serrated garden shears. An interesting fact about this is that it raises some questions about how much water resistance the protruding teeth caused Adestus to experience. If it was significant, Adestus would have had to put in extra effort to swim forward, which would have been more noticeable for potential prey. This leads to a possible theory on the cause of Adestus' extinction. It might have evolved to hunt and eat specific prey, and when that prey disappeared, so did it. Something you see rather commonly with top or specialized predators that need a specific way of life or environment to stay the same. The history of Earth and life on our planet shows that things never stay the same forever. Top predators, entire ecosystems, and ways of life come and go and they will continue to do so. It's a tale as old as our planet. This genus also had some very large species, as I hinted at a moment ago. The largest species got as large as the biggest great whites today, 20 feet long and sometimes more. Adestus might very well have been the largest marine predator to have ever existed at that point, or one of the largest. It is definitely higher up on that list if Dunkleosius turns out to have been much smaller than we first thought. One of the non-valid species, Adestus gigantus, is only known from a single tooth, but as you can imagine from the name, it is thought to have been on the larger side. The body shape of the animal is a plan shared today with not only great white sharks, but also other open water predatory fish like swordfish and tuna. Of the four, or up to 13, species of Adestus, they had different patterns of teeth between them. The species and genus are divided into two groups, ones with asymmetrical crowns that slant forward and those with symmetrical crowns. Adestus newtoni, the one I mentioned earlier with the much more curved whorls than others in the genus, has been noticed by paleontologists for this and it has been suggested to actually be placed in another genus altogether, Lystrotus newtoni. If the genus Lystrotus is a valid one, then the only known species in it would be Lystrotus newtoni. I don't know if there is a consistency on if newtoni is a representation of a new genus or a member of the Adestus one, Different sources I read said different things. Some said Lestrotus was valid, 
Some said it goes back and forth between the two, and some said Newtoni is still considered an Adestis, and it is only theorized to be something else. If someone knows the clear answer on this one, I'd love to hear it. As I've mentioned, Adestis lived in the Carboniferous period, specifically in the Pennsylvanian, or the late Carboniferous, which lasted from 323 to 299 million years ago. Adestis lived from around the middle of the late Carboniferous, right up until or before the Carboniferous rainforest collapse. The oxygen in this time period was noticeably higher than today, not just resulting in giant bugs, but it also would have been lethal to you. If you were dropped in the Carboniferous right now without any special breathing equipment, where oxygen levels were anywhere between 15 to 30% higher than they are today, depending on when you got dropped, and Adestis didn't eat you, you'd get about a week to two weeks before the high oxygen would kill you, and it would be absolutely horrific. But that happy topic is not the subject of this video, so let's get back to it. At the start of the Carboniferous, global temperatures were warm, nearly 70 Fahrenheit on average, and it wasn't until the middle of the Carboniferous that the temperature started to go down again. The environment and climate in the late Carboniferous saw things getting a bit cooler than compared to the lush tropical swampy jungles one pictures when thinking about this era. By the start of the late Carboniferous, the temperatures were cool enough to where ice and glaciers could form at the South Pole. These glaciers extended out to cover a large area, and this cooling and drying of the atmosphere would only continue as the Carboniferous moved towards its ultimate end. Deep ocean temperatures during this time were also cold due to all the cold water that flowed down there from the melting ice. The cooling of the atmosphere eventually contributed to the Carboniferous rainforest collapse, where tropical rainforests were replaced by arid deserts at the start of the Permian. But that could also warrant a video on its own, so if you'd like to see that, let me know. In short, though, the Carboniferous Rainforest Collapse, or CRC, was an extinction event that occurred roughly 305 million years ago, and it is around this time that Adestis fossils stop appearing as well. The collapse saw the coal forests, the swamps and rainforests, vanish from large sections of the Earth. Not fully, but they no longer covered the entire planet. This did cause extinction events, but these are not considered mass extinctions. So I'm going to touch on some of the related animals that are in the same order of fish as Adestis is, such as Sarcoprion, Parahelicoprion, Toxoprion, Agazizotus, and Campyloprion. I think those last two were right. I could not find pronunciations for them. Please don't burn me at the stake if I'm wrong. Please don't drop me in the Carboniferous if I'm wrong. I'm going to keep this section brief, maybe only a few fun facts on each of these, and maybe a little extra detail on some of the more well-understood ones. As a collective bunch, this order is poorly understood, partially due to the lack of fossils past, you know, the teeth. So starting off with Sarcoprion, belonging to the Edestodia superfamily of the clade, but actually being a closer relative to Helicoprion than it is to Edestus, this bizarre swordfish-looking guy also sports the same unique tooth whorls and structure that you see on Adestus. In fact, they look similar at a quick glance. Like Adestus, this one had just the most delightful and comforting sounding name. Its name means Flesh Saw, which just sounds like a serial killer. There's one called Metal Fang, so why not Flesh Saw? Like its relatives, Adestus and Helicoprion, this animal's most recognizable trait and like them, what it's best known for is its bizarre tooth morphology. You don't see teeth like these in sharks now or in any other fish, even the few relatives of these that are still clinging on today, you don't see teeth like this anymore. Sarcoprion's tooth whorls were sharper, more compact, and grew in a nice uniform way and not into an unwieldy mess. Its mouth structure also allowed this animal to be more hydrodynamic, with a larger rostrum and a small shape to the tooth whorl. Like a Destus, this one got to be about as big as some of the largest great whites, somewhere around 20 feet in length. A shark-like fish called Flesh Saw that grew to 20 feet long. <laughs> oh boy. Next up is one that looks like a cross between a swordfish and a helicoprion, Parahelicoprion. This one is known from the Ural Mountains of Russia, 
and the Copacabana Formation in Bolivia. This one's name means nearly coiled saw, which refers to its relative helicoprion. The original holotype of this animal was poorly preserved, but despite some fragmentary fossils, there are qualities that separate this one from helicoprion, such as the thickness, angle, and shape of the tooth whorl. Like helicoprion, this shark-like fish lived in the Permian. How exactly he parahelicoprion used its teeth are unknown, but it's thought it used them like a hatchet when attacking its prey. Next, toxoprion. This one lived in the early Carboniferous, and it lasted until the late Permian, meaning it was one of the most successful of all the genus in the clade. Its fossils have been found near Eureka, Nevada, and it is known for having heavily serrated teeth, which grew outwards on the lower jaw, as you can see in the art on screen. Unlike with Helicoprion, the whorls did not curve back in on itself, but grew in the downward form we see on Adestus and Lestrotus, if that one is valid. Despite lasting so long, as of now, this genus only contains one known species. Agazizotus, man, I really hope I said that name right. I picked this one just because of that name, because wow. Most of these have relatively easy to say names, and then there's Tongue Twister Shark here. This one comes from the Helicoprion side of the family, and like all the others that we have talked about, its mouth contained a whorl of serrated teeth with the bottom jaw being well-built for crushing. Lovely. Tooth fragments of this animal have been found in Illinois as well as Kansas, but some of these fossils belong to another genus or a Gazazotus or even represent an entirely new one to science. It's really unclear. This one is doesn't seem to be too well understood from what I read about it. Honestly, this one just kind of left me confused, just like trying to say its name. And finally, we have... Camplio Prion. I'm pretty sure that's how you said the name. If I'm wrong, please feel free to tear me apart in the comments. Just don't use your serrated teeth to do it. Probably the most obscure and poorly understood of all of these, so saving it for last is kind of perfect because my opening rant here will probably be longer than what I have to say about the animal itself. Like the others, this was a huge shark-like fish that now lived in what is now Texas and New Mexico, and then also in Russia as well. The U.S. specimens and the Russian ones represent two different species, and these are the only two known to be in the genus so far. The fossils date this animal to 303 to 299 million years ago. It vanished at the same time as the Carboniferous came to an end. Some paleontologists suggest that this animal is a direct ancestor to Helicoprion that evolved to fit the niche left behind by Adestus when it went extinct due to a tiny gap that separates the fossils of the two. This one is perhaps the largest of all the shark-like fish we have talked about today. In fact, it was possibly one of the largest animals of the Carboniferous because the size of its teeth indicate that it grew up to 30 feet long. Different reconstructions, I've seen vary the snout shape of the animal, but if we have any fossils of the snout area, I don't know. I doubt it due to how rarely bones from this fish, this fish fossilize, but I've seen almost every depiction show it differently, so maybe there is something there. But yeah, um, king of the ocean here, 30 feet long, no thank you. I I'm done, I'm leaving. I'm leaving the Carboniferous Oceans behind now. Good day, sir. And that was Adestus, the Devourer, the scissor tooth Shark, and Assorted Company of Relatives. I hope you enjoyed this video. This was a really fun one to research, and I personally just really find this animal and its extended clade really fascinating, so this was a long overdue video. I've said it before, but I think like a movie that showed something that had the premise of along the lines of 65 about people, you know, be being chased by an Adestus or a whole shiver of them in a shallow coastal swamp would be cool, absolutely terrifying, and if I go for writing my story I mentioned, about people being trapped in the Carboniferous, that is definitely something I want to work into it. Maybe one day we'll go back and we'll cover some of the other fish in this extended family because there are a lot more. But for now, that is the end of the video. If you want to see more of my character version 2, the hybrid dinosaur with the teeth and tooth structure from this shark, I'll put one of my narrated stories at the end here that does have him in it. I'll also link my most recent paleo video too, so please check one of those out if you are interested in either. Comment, like, and subscribe if you did enjoy and you want to see more because it not only helps me grow, but it lets me know this is the kind of content you enjoy and you want to see more of it. 
I do paleo videos on my channel semi-regularly, along with a slew of other topics that you might find interesting. And tell me paleontology topics you want to see covered in a future video. I do take requests into consideration. And with all that said, thank you for watching, and I will see you in the next video. Also, shout out to the artist who did the Adestus for the thumbnail. She also did the Helicoprion art for that video, and you can find her socials linked in the description. She does fantastic paleo art. If you need any drawn, I highly recommend her as an artist. With that said, I'm going to go. I got to get out of the water before an Adestus turns up. So have a good one, everyone. And once again, thank you for watching.